zinc lead mine. Our speakers today are Mark O'Brien, who is a Vancouver-based consulting resource geologist and director of Red Pen and Geosciences. Mark is a mining ind industry professional with experience across the spectrum of exploration and mine geology, geostatistics, resource estimation, and mine management. Mark survived 17 years in many capacities with Anglo-American and then 12 years with Anglo Gold Ashanti before becoming a consulting geologist. He was a secretary and chairman of the SAMREC Codes Committee from 1999 to 2011, contributing to the development of reporting codes, and he has a deep knowledge of international mineral resource and mineral reserve reporting. Mark is a competent person across many commodities and has worked on projects and operations in North and South America, Africa, Russia, many of the Stans, Australia and Ireland. Our second speaker is Matt Mullins, who is a London and Johannesburg based consulting resource geologist and director of Tacoma Strategies Limited. Matt is a mining industry professional with extensive experience in most aspects of exploration and mine geology. He has worked for the usual suspects in Goldfield, Cicero, Severin Mining, Barrick, BHP and Arsenal Mittal before becoming a consulting geologist and has bounced back from three retrenchments. He was chairman of the SAMREC and SAMVAL codes committees, delivering the 2007 SAMREC updated code and the first SAMVAL code in 2008. He has been vice chair and chair of the SAM code standards committee and is currently a member of the Oz IMM ethics committee. Matt's a competent person across most major commodities and is also a competent geo tourist, having worked on projects and operations pretty much all over the world including some interesting places like Cuba and Suriname. It will be interesting to see where his new role at Snowden as executive consultant takes him. We'd also like to thank Matt um, and Tacoma Strategies for sponsoring all the talks for September. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to put these fantastic talks um, together. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Mark and Matt. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Please go ahead. Hi guys, uh, I'm Mike O'Brien. I'm going to uh, kick off this uh, description of some recent uh, work done at the Perrine Zinc Lead Deposit. I should stress that this has been a team effort and it has involved myself, Matt Mullins, Matthew Jarvis, Jeff Leader, the previous uh, mine manager when it was actually an operation. And Colin Carey, um, Matt and Colin have had a long history with the uh, deposit, uh, dating back to uh, when it was an operating mine. Just to um, give you some uh, background, the uh, deposit was initially discovered by Shell in the late 1970s. In fact, I think it was 1978. Um, it's about uh, 2 billion years old. It's a Mississippi Valley type uh, zinc lead deposit. It's hosted in dolomites of the Revelo formation of the Campbell Runt uh, subgroup. And it's the largest of a number of known uh, lead zinc occurrences. Uh, for example, Bushy Park has, shows some similarities all hosted on the uh, Neoarchean platform dollar stones of the Transvaal Supergroup. Uh, in 1986, an initial mineral resource of 18 million tons at an average grade of 3.6% zinc and 0.6% uh, lead was declared by Shell. Um, I think uh, if you retain the the uh, tonnage of 18 million in the back of your mind, that might be uh, interesting to compare at the end of this, of this uh, presentation. It was first mined by Shell's mining division, then called Billiton PLC, and then later by BHP after Gencore had acquired Billiton PLC from Shell. Gencore retained Billiton PLC for all its uh, non-precious metal assets. Um, Moving on to some more introduction. Um, the mining took place between 86 and 2004. 468,000 tons of zinc 
in concentrates and 85,000 tons of lead in concentrate. 20.5 million tons of run of mine ore was milled at uh, uh, to give approximately well at a uh, with a head grade of 2.6% zinc and 0.6% lead. Production averaged uh, 1.2 million tons of run of mine ore per annum. There are two existing excavations, the main pit to a depth of 120 meters shown on the uh, view on the right hand side and the P24 pit to a depth of 60 meters and that is slightly to the uh, northeast of the main pit. There are approximately 22 million tons of potential low grade material sitting in dumps on the site as well. Concentrate was historically produced on site and it was trucked and railed to uh, local customers. So that gives you some idea of the economics and the scale of the operation. In terms of uh, stratigraphic setting, as mentioned before, hosted in flatlying dolomites of the Stierkdurungs member of the Revelo formation of the Campbell Run subgroup. Characterized by columnar stromatolytic units with massive dolomitic units and some thinner carbonaceous shale interbeds. There's an upper massive dolomite capping the locally named pairing sequence. And this dolomite is overlain by a ripple marked sequence, which is a convenient marker horizon. The rate right columnar stromatolytic units and they have remarkable local persistence as does the wafer dolomite which is a cryptalgal laminated dolomite with fine sparry dolomite along the bedding. We'll see some of this in three dimensions later on with a bit of luck. Just a, a slight segue into, uh, into a slightly different uh, arena than economic geology. A quick uh, segue into planetary and impact geology. Within the Montable Formation, which is towards the bottom of the, of the previous uh, stratigraphic diagram, there's a layer of distinctive sand-sized spherules of silicate melt. And these particles are typical of those that have been produced by known impact events. This spherule layer is enclosed in surrounding volcanic tufts, shale carbonate, there is anomalous enrichment in iridium concentrations relative to the enclosing rocks. And as we, we've heard often before, uh, anomalous iridium is associated with the famous uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundary where uh, a massive uh, impact event took place and uh, uh, wiped out most life on Earth. Well, most major life on Earth, large scale animals at any rate. Other siderophile element, elements, such as platinum group elements, are also somewhat enriched. There are other spherule layers known from similar edged rocks in the Hammersley Basin in Western Australia, where they have also been in, interpreted as of being of impact origin. Simonson et al. Uh, concluded, concluded that the impact layer in Australia and that pairing have a common origin. And in the center of this slide, we have a, a view of eight centimeters of, uh, of core, which has been uh, cut and sliced. The upper light gray layer consists of spherules mixed with quartzo sand. There's a medial dark gray layer. And under that, another light gray basal layer rich in spherules, some of which have actually been flattened by compaction. And uh, there's a broken contact at the bottom of this uh, uh, sample separating it from the underlying shale. Moving back to the uh, more conventional uh, economic geology and uh, modeling part of the presentation. Uh, the conceptual geological model consists of uh, a plumbing system with vertically ascending metal rich hypersaline brines which uh, penetrated and brecciated the sub-horizontal dolomitic sequence. And this, these fluids obviously took advantage of weaknesses associated with pre-existing caustic conditions. Um, the metals were preferentially precipitated within the hydraulic breaches created uh, through this movement of, of uh, fluid. 
There was a preferential lateral spread through the more porous stromatolytic sequences, uh, which tends to follow, uh, as, you may, uh, as you might think, the local stratigraphic uh, uh, disposition. And uh, that lateral movement uh, led, leads to a pattern of mineralization which diminishes away from the central core where the brecciation took place and the initial fluids uh, uh, moved upwards into the sequence. In terms of uh, the level of exploration that was carried out over a considerable number of uh, years, there are uh, 1,085 uh, diamond drill holes, 2,395 deep blast holes, 36 uh, due diligence uh, holes were drilled, 29 twin holes were drilled, and there are a major amount of blast holes, more than 128,000. All these holes were sampled from zinc and lead and were logged, obviously, for stratigraphy and mineralization. Uh, one should take one's hat off to the uh, uh, previous uh, owners and operators of the operation in that that information was meticulously recorded, is very consistent, and certainly makes for very easy subsequent modeling. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a, a uh, I think it's, it's uh, 411 elevation section through the deposit showing the positions of the drill holes. The tiny black specks are the uh, great control holes in the pit itself. Uh, the blue holes are uh, diamond drill. The red uh, blobs are, uh, are um, due diligence and twin holes. And uh, you can see some of the blue uh, uh, detailed uh, lateral uh, geostatistical cross and traverse holes in the main pit itself, which is certainly very useful for working out the short range variability of the deposit in space. Here is a, a view of uh, the detailed 3D stratigraphic model that was created. Uh, you can see the various stratigraphic units uh, cropping out on the margins of the interior of the existing pits. And uh, on the surface, we have some gray dumps indicated. So uh, obviously those are not part of the natural stratigraphic section. Um, Leapfrog Geo was the uh, software of choice that we applied to this project. Uh, the downhole lithology and mineralization style logging data was, uh, was the basis for the model. And um, the two breccia bodies, which you can see in the center of the, uh, of the um, main pit, uh, are indicated in, in blue and red blobs. And uh, those were built in a, uh, an intrusive style of logic, so with uh, sub-vertical uh, characteristics, whereas obviously the stratigraphic units were built out laterally in a stratigraphic sub-horizontal form. And uh, that architecture and the grade distributions picked up from the various uh, drilling campaigns uh, dictate the overall pattern of the mineralization and the estimation domains. This is a section across the main pit. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the uh, mixture of diamond drill holes indicating grades on each side of the pit and the um, blast hole grade control drilling uh, which has been tagged according to the stratigraphic uh, units that, that uh, each of the holes belongs to, provide a very comprehensive and detailed uh, section across the deposit. There's very strong evidence of, uh, of uh, 
effectively, uh, I hesitate to say strata bound, but strata parallel mineralization. And uh, this extends beyond the previously mined extents, and in fact, extends beyond the resource and, uh, and reserve that has been defined in that later work. Just to uh, give a bit of uh, philosophy to the idea of geological models transitioning through to usable and practical resource estimation domains. Uh, the key points are to use all available information, exploration, great control, historical production to provide some form of reconciliation on any estimation that is done. A key element is integrating all that information together and experiment with different conformations and architectures to uh, figure out what is most plausible and most likely and optimize it to an extent. And ultimately to produce a holistic model that is gonna be fit for purpose. On the right hand side, I've taken some kind of random elements of uh, architecture and slapped them in. Uh, there's a pair of eyeballs and a top hat, and of course a wizard. We all need a certain amount of magic when we uh, develop these models. And uh, if you follow the, the chain of evidence and strap it all together into a workable model, you should end up with some ingots of metal and some uh, rands or dollars at the end of the process. In terms of the more specific elements of uh, the pairing model, uh, the breaches are the sources of the mineralizing fluids. Uh, the permeable stratigraphic units form a plumbing system which conveyed the metals into more distal parts of the deposit. Uh, fluid mixing has taken place within the uh, aquifer formed by the more permeable units. Uh, there there has been some form of reaction between the fluids mixing as well as the, uh, as the host rock. And the architecture of, these, uh, of this plumbing and mineralization uh, should reflect that type of hierarchy. I've uh, shown a little cartoon on the right hand side giving you the breaches forming the, the faucet or the tap providing the mineralizing fluid that being distributed within the stratigraphic units and uh, forming a trap site which has operated over an extended period of time with uh, different types of fluids mixing and depositing metals uh, kind of like a, a mouse and a, and a turtle or a tortoise and um, we see evidence for that in the variable ratio of zinc to lead in the deposit. Just to uh, give one an idea of what the, uh, what the endowment looks like, uh, here's another section uh, along the margin, the eastern margin of the, uh, of the uh, main pit. And uh, as you can see from the drill hole traces and the uh, grade profiles running down those holes, uh, there's lateral continuity, uh, which uh, is quite extensive. And I've highlighted in a yellow oval, uh, persistent mineralization still occurring at depth. There is limited uh, drilling to depth. So the level of continuity is, is uh, unproven at this stage, but uh, certainly worth investigating as time proceeds. This is a view of the, um, of the uh, various domains that were used for estimation. The breaches were modeled as pipe-like bodies with vertical continuity. Uh, an approach was used to uh, apply an indicator model at 0.1% uh, zinc and at 0.2% zinc at different uh, probability expressions to uh, generate uh, sub-horizontal strata-bound strata units that uh, 
indicate where the mineralization is most likely to occur and to group uh, samples together in uh, regions where they behave in a way that enables estimation to take place. This is where I'll, I'd like to uh, just segue off and have a look at a model. I'm going to use uh, leapfrog uh, view and a viewer file to have a look at the model itself. Here it is, the stratigraphic uh, units, sub-horizontally disposed. We have a lot of detail in there because we have uh, a lot of uh, information. Uh, there's the, these are, I have not uh, displayed the grade control data. So uh, in the central portions of the main pit, you're only looking at about one third to one quarter of the total amount of available information. If, uh, if we uh, have a look at the breaches, there's the uh, rubble breacher, which tends to be barren sitting on the south edge of the main pit. And um, let me see if I can locate it in this immense list of stratigraphy. Um, there's the, uh, the main breccia, which uh, tends to hog a lot of the mineralization. Here we have another view of the model. This time I've included all the assay data uh, the topography, you can see the dumps, you can see the breccia units, uh, which I'm displaying here in a, in a transparent form. If we strip away the topography, we can actually see those breccias, we can see the grades, and we can see the sub-horizontal um, disseminated mineralization spreading out from the source of the fluids. Just looking at a section through the uh, through the deposit, this is the main pit on the uh, on the south south western side of this section. Here is the uh, the smaller pit to the northeast, and uh, we can see the abundance of grade control data, very dense network and uh, exposure of grades. We're looking at zinc grades here, ranging between uh, Point 0.1, about cut it off in the blocks, going up to 5% uh, zinc. And uh, we can actually uh, step our way through this model at uh, 20 meter intervals to get some idea of what the uh, block model pattern looks like and how it conforms to the, uh, to the drill hole data that's available. This is a Total model, uh, it blocks have been estimated above current topography for completeness. And uh, so don't worry too much about these guys. They're, uh, they're phantom blocks. They, they never e existed in, uh, well, at least not in, in human history, but uh, there we are. Okay, I think I'll move on from the model. And, uh, Moving to the next slide. Here we have the mineral resources as they currently stand in terms of measured, indicated, and inferred. We're looking at roughly, uh, well, at 21.4 million tons. If we think back to the 1970, uh, 1980s figure, for the original um, mineral resource that was defined, it was 18 million tons. Obviously, the latest mineral resource is considerably uh, lower grade. The original mineral resource was in excess of 3% zinc. Uh, we're looking at uh, the region in the region of 1.6% zinc. But it gives you some idea that old properties uh, can be resurrected and brought back to uh, to life given the right economic conditions. 
and certainly also given the right institutional memory in the form of data that's allowed to survive in a comprehensive and, uh, and, uh, and uh, copious form where people are able to remodel it after, after a long period of time. And also given the expertise, people like Jeff Leader, who are still available for us to uh, use to uh, better define a mineral resource and a deposit. I think I'll now pass across to uh, pass this across to Matt Mullins to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's a really sterling effort for 4 a.m. Uh, Vancouver time. It certainly has been a, a pleasure working with uh, a team of people from a variety of backgrounds in this on this project and especially with the, the team from uh, Ambono and Pairing Base Minerals. Colin uh, and myself have been involved with this, with pairing on and off uh, since the late 90s. And Jeff Leader was general, well, a metallurgist, metallurgical manager and general manager of, um, of pairing until it closed in 2003. And, um, uh, Matthew Jarvis showed conclusively how you can integrate the financial modeling with the technical disciplines to come up with a, a very superior view of um, future development. As Mike mentioned, there is a significant amount of information available which be, has been fairly meticulously preserved. And I'll show you, you here just some of the production statistics of the mine. Um, the top left shows in blue, the tonnages. These are based on, I think, daily and uh, tonnages. And you can see the um, monthly tonnages increasing from about 100,000 uh, tons per month to about 120,000 tons per month, ending up at about uh, close to 1.2 million tons per year that was uh, fed through the plant. Initial grades were entirely in line with the Initial ore reserve done in 86 of 3.6 um, grades, close to four were experienced uh, for the first couple of years, but then dropped off steadily as, um, as mining progressed down and, and laterally. That blip at the end of the life in terms of the zinc grade being a little bit of high grading that was done in the last couple of months. Lead grades, uh, in contrast, fairly low, averaging about 0.6, which was in line with the original or reserve estimate. You can see on the, on the top right, the tannins, tannages and grades initially very high due to low recoveries as I'll explain, and um, both in terms of lead and zinc with some um, blips taking place during the life of the operation. The initial, uh, if we look at the bottom left, recoveries were fairly low, both for lead and zinc, as mining progressed through what were called the oxidized layers, the first couple of benches, um, these were zinc was present not just in sphalerite or sulfidized form, but there was a lot of zinc carbonate, mostly smithsonite around, and then there was also quite a lot of zinc uh, lead oxide, mostly uh, sericite, but other minerals were were also present. These obviously had a poor response in the metallurgical process. Uh, Jeff, if you're online, uh, you can comment at the end. It would be much appreciated. And uh, largely affected recoveries. So not only were the grades going on to the tailings dam high, but a certain amount of ore, high grade ore, which was deemed to be oxidized or uh, with carbonate minerals in it, was stockpiled in what was called the sub ore dump, um, about a million tons of that. Recoveries settled down after the first couple of years and average for zinc about 90% and for lead about just over 73, 74%. As Mike mentioned, there's a poor correlation between zinc and lead, and that's because of the multiple mineralizing events and brecciation events that occurred. Um, and you can see the correlation between zinc head grade and lead head grade is pretty poor. The contribution of lead to the overall um, economics is fairly low, and that also led to our decision to apply a cutoff grade based on zinc alone. 
uh, in the model might and show the, the lead grades that much, but you would see that generally in most areas there's a fairly poor correlation in the block model between zinc and lead, and they, they were thus modeled together. They weren't modeled, um, in, modeled individually, not, um, not uh, together. If we move on to next slide. So I'll go straight to the first step in the mine planning process, as Mark mentioned, in conversion to, um, to an economic dollar value. And this is the pit optimization process whereby all the, the basis is the all body model and all costs and revenues are put into the, in this case, the Lurch Grossman algorithm to calculate for successively larger pits what the net present value can be achieved. The theory being that the optimized pit is the pit in which the uh, highest revenue under the circum, under the scenario that you're modeling um, is found. We, we did multiple put optimizations based on different size of uh, uh, throughput. So anything from 1.2 to 3.6 million tons per year. We, we changed the mining costs, the processing costs, the total costs. Uh, we changed the recoveries and we changed the revenues to determine the robustness of the pit optimization process. In all cases, we achieved positive NPVs. Uh, I haven't shown you the, the numbers on the left-hand side, but um, the NPVs were, were pretty healthy and considerable. And uh, we certainly had no uh, concerns about, uh, for the resource, uh, eventual economic extraction, and to um, declare a reserve as well. We, ran it under different scenarios of different mining schedules. It's a, quite a tricky pit, as Mark showed you, to actually mine. And the green NPV curve shows the selected schedule. Um, in practice, once it gets to detailed design, one would expect to be able to improve on the green schedule um, to a certain extent towards the best case scenario, which is shown in the blue schedule. But uh, all of our work and design and reserves are based on the green schedule. We, with the associated financial modeling that was done, we were happy to um, declare a reserve at, in terms of pit number, pit 49, I'll show you the numbers later. And we decided to declare the resource at pit 7067, which you can see is where the second step in that curve takes place, keeping all of the other parameters the same. The reason for that was to be able to satisfy the requirements for reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction in the resource declaration. Let's go on to the next one. <clears throat> this shows one of the scenarios that we did in terms of the um, Mining schedule, this was done in Whittle, and it required a number of iterations of, as I said earlier, of determining the phase pits and in terms of uh, what level of tonnage we, we could mine and what level of waste we needed to mine to get there. This, this particular schedule, um, you can see, is based on the 1.2 million tons of runner mine ore into the pit, into the plant uh, per year for 15 years with a significant amount of waste in the first six, seven years. The reason for that is that one has to go through those upper levels and a, and a fair amount of waste before you get into the higher grades below that, as Mark showed quite clearly in the, um, in the model. And that is the reason why zinc grades gradually increase up to year six as you get into that uh, very, very nice high grade area that Mark showed and then gradually decrease thereafter as one moves laterally out towards the, the fringes of the deposit. Uh, lead, as you can see, doesn't quite follow the same pattern. It's fairly high in early years and then drops off uh, steadily towards the end of the life. But because it's such a small contributor to the overall revenue, we weren't too worried about it. Uh, in the next slide, a key um, aspect is which price to use. So we did a fair amount of investigation 
into the zinc market. Both, um, I think all of us have been involved with zinc and zinc mining and uh, over many years, I understand that it's, that it's um, an, an interesting metal in um, line with the other base metals suite it dropped considerably over the pandemic times although one has to notice that it, it was already coming off a bit it bottomed at about eighteen hundred dollars per ton and since then exactly in line with the other base metals it's seen a steady increase although not as spectacularly as some of the others like copper sitting at about two thousand three hundred dollars per ton most analysts or consensus um, estimates that it'll, it'll top off at about 2,600 towards the end of the year and then stay steady or drop off slightly as concerns of Chinese surplus zinc production start, um, start hitting us. But there's a, a fair amount of uncertainty in the zinc market and we're not sure about that. Stocks are climbing though. And we do need to be concerned a little bit about, about that. We used a conservative price of just over $2,000 a ton in all of our modeling, and especially in the financial modeling, which, um, as I said, was comprehensively done. Uh, that we, Matthew Jarvis looked after that, but he worked as an integral part of the team in terms of um, setting up the model, setting it up to model different scenarios. I didn't mention that we also modeled a dense media separation scenario as well, uh, as well as a straight concentrating um, model. And we also had the ability to switch on and off the mining and processing of the stockpiles as well. I think that leads me pretty much to the last one. See how we're doing for time, not too bad. So th we there then from the resource model from the pit optimization from the financial modeling, we took a fairly comprehensive feasibility study that was done a couple of years ago, which had been, uh, some of the numbers in that study had been updated uh, successfully over the years. We updated the relevant ones for input into uh, the financial models and the pit optimization. And with the technical work that had been done, our understanding of the market, we are happy to declare a reserve. That reserve was based on the, that pit optimization, pit 49 that I showed you. We decided to declare a cutoff at, at a cutoff of 0.9, which is consistent with what the mine operated at for much of its life, and also is higher than the, the actual cutoff of about 0.5, 0.6. That results in a tonnage of 15.6, a zinc rate of 1.8, lead grade of 0.3, a, a combined grade of 2.1, and about 280,000 tons of zinc that remains as run of mine tonnage. A smaller contribution, as I said earlier, of about 44,000 tons of lead. And I think that leads me to the last slide. Just to conclude, um, from our study, it was, Pering was a very successful mine in the Shell Billiton BHP stable. It um, operated and closed after about 17 years. In some years when the zinc price spiked, as Jeff, if, if he's on the line, might want to comment on, it produced a, a significant amount of revenue in those um, high price years, as those of us who have seen these price sparks in many different markets like rhodium, manganese, cobalt, and others know how much that can contribute to revenue in individual um, commodity price uh, sparks. This, this mine planning that we've done builds on the work that was done in 2010, which was associated with a comprehensive feasibility study. And to the extent that we have been able to update the mineral resources and mineral reserves. Um, as Mark has shown, 21 million tons of mineral resource and about 16 million tons of mineral reserves, which remain to be mined. Mark also showed the, that there is exploration potential that sits outside of the mineral resources. 
the lateral continuity in some areas has not been uh, away from the pit. We found areas a kilometer away from the pit showing patches of mineralization that we haven't modeled. And Mark also showed that modeling in depth um, had uh, some holes that intersected some quite significant mineralization that is currently untested in terms of its continuity. In addition, just to make a comment on it, the, one of the things that's puzzled people who've worked on the pairing deposit for many years is why we don't have more pairings in the area. Anyone who's worked on Mississippi Valley top deposits know that they occur in clumps or um, multiple deposits. Pairing, if you discount Bushy Park and a number of minor occurrences, seems to be an anomaly to that. It may be associated with the excessive age of two Million years, which is different to many other Mississippi Valley top deposits, which are a lot younger. But one of the, the reasons for it is that those additional deposits may still be there, but may be hidden. You look at the lateral continuity of some of those in depth um, zones at pairing, one can imagine that mineralizing fluids that are whirling upwards could possibly spread outwards kept by those massive dolomites, unless there is a zone of weakness such as incipient uh, castification in which it could uh, ex uh, exploit and move up to surface. So I'll leave you, I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, last slide, just questions. Um, I'd like to just thank the team. It's been an absolutely fascinating study to work on a deposit as Mark said, that the corporate history of some of these deposits is so important in getting to a solution. To me, it's, it's in, very satisfying to know that, that many deposits that we work on throughout our careers have a new life. There are different ways of looking at things, different ways of processing it, which are ones that we shouldn't um, discount. And we should always remember as we're mining a deposit that there could be future life and future um, potential in what we're looking at, if we look at it uh, slightly different. I'd like to just thank um, Bono Pairing Based Minerals, especially, you know, for the opportunity to work on this fascinating deposit. And I think it's time to, Nolene, just hand over to a couple of questions. Thanks so much, Matt and Mark. That's a fascinating presentation. And I'm certain there will be some questions. So uh, please raise your hand or just jump right in. Anybody, you can start. No questions? Um, maybe just one from me. I may have missed it, but who, who are the current owners of the project? Here, it's a company called Pairing Base Minerals, and it has a number of shareholders. Anyone else with any questions or comments? Nolene, it's Matthew here. Um, just a question to Michael or Matthew. I mean, if you look at the other minerals that are in that, um, that zone, the manganese in particular, it's all fluid. Uh, it's all fluid, uh, fluid in place mineralization. So if you look at the lateral extent of the manganese deposits, I mean, that, that may indicate that the zinc deposits in that region could also be laterally extensive. Is that? Is that correct or, or not necessarily the case? There, there are, I can answer partially that. There are people who know much more about this than, than I do, people who've worked in, in this area for many, many decades. A lot of the old bulletin people, but many people in, involved out there. But I do know of a number of old holes that were drilled to the west of Mamatuan, mine, and that is, how far is that, Matthew, from Herring? 100 kilometers, maybe? Which, yeah, I think approximately that, yes. Which I believe have intersected sniffs of lead zinc mineralization in the Dolomites. As you know as well, it's a very complex, uh, faulted environment as you go southwest, um, and you could very well have slivers of Dolomite hosting uh, mineralization in some of those faulted entities in terms of the, the reverse faulting that takes place in that area. 
No good. So it sounds like the potential is certainly there for other of these type deposits, perhaps even a depth. I think so, but it would take some fairly systematic exploration. The Murray Hitzman gave a lunchtime talk about a month ago, I think, and on the zinc deposits in Ireland, showing how important the role of geochemistry, especially trace element geochemistry, was in vectoring to uh, possible new deposits in in the Irish um, situation. And I don't know if anyone has done any systematic work in that regard on in this particular area. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, are there any other questions or comments for them? Well, your presentation must have been very clear then. Thank you. <laughs> Clear from oh, hang on, hang on. and London. I saw the Anne put her hand up. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's more of a comment. I work at the Council for Geoscience. We started doing a little bit of exploration for MVT deposits in Africa and West. Um, we've got a few projects, well, uh, overall mapping project working there. And we just started with it, but um, I made my first model that I did was for Bushy Park, just to understand a little bit more about the mineralization system um, and also have some of the boreholes there. It's just a comment just to say it's an ongoing project and we're using geochem data, everything that we have to do more exten extensive exploration. Yeah, and we'll see where we get. So it's something to, to look forward to. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic to hear. I'm convinced that more zinc and lead will be found in the broader area in, in that um, part of yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think, well, I think some of them are quite deep. Um, we do have a few new targets. Um, and actually, we found most of those targets is basically appreciated um, um, outcrops that we found through DTM. That was the, the best way to see them. Um, the thing just with this is, I mean, yeah, we do basic exploration, we do targeting, but, you know, it's then up to someone else to go do drilling. If there's yeah. something we can really see that we can say, identify and say we really think there's a good potential, um, mm -hmm. let's do a few drill holes from the council side. Um, you know, this, that is possible, but we haven't really seen something like that yet. That's um, interesting. Sorry, good sorry. Exploration, good exploration part is definitely around the frequent waste fault. Um, we're also doing a lot of mapping there now. So maybe they will come through that or they will come maybe something out of that. I hope so. Yeah. And so do I. It's interesting how herring was found originally through basically rock chip regional sampling on surface. Um, okay. Know. Yeah. <laughs> So standard, standard exploration techniques um, led to the discovery. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think just South Africans, we don't really know a lot about MVT. So it's, it's new for a lot of us. And then there's some guys that are older, and, but the, the technology is getting better. So we just need to combine what we have and come up with something. But yeah, definitely geochem, I agree. Um, I'm looking forward to that data coming out. So I think in the few in the next few years from the council side, um, all the frequent waste stuff will probably be quite interesting. Excellent. We wish you luck. Thank you. And Paul, you have a question? Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, although I was having a bit of connection problems, but I just wanted to ask. Like I also do 3D modeling of the subsurface, but I use Archicad and I render with Lumion. So I wanted to know uh, how can I uh, get uh, to learn a uh, leapfrog or how, wh what process should I go through in order to get to learn leapfrog? Thank you. I think your best bet, Mpo, is to uh, is to speak to the guys in the in the sequent office. Um, I'm not sure if they still have an office in Johannesburg, 
but uh, you can certainly get them online, send them a, a, a query, and they'll uh, give you some indication of how to go about either purchasing a license or if you're using it for academic purposes, I think they have a free license, uh, obviously limited time uh, type option to, uh, to explore. But it's, uh, have, a, have a look on the web. It's uh, the company's actual name nowadays is Sequent. That is spelled S-E-E-Q-U-E-N-T. And uh, they, they produce a whole lot of, uh, and they manage and, uh, and write a whole lot of uh, software products which are widely used now in the mineral industry, in exploration and in academia. Thank you so much. Richard, you have a question. Thanks, Nolene. Um, just thanks very much, Matt, for the great presentation, Matt and Mike, uh, and, and Greg, for your hard work. It's been really fantastic. Um, actually, questions to, to Lean about the council data. Um, will, that cut, will that data be made public, or how, how does that go about to file that data? Yeah. Um... I never know how to answer this question. I know they are busy with some, some, some plans to make stuff available easier. Um, but I can't really comment on that, to be honest. But I mean, like we do have a few, you know, we've got our GeoClip. We know, we, a lot of people know what we are working on currently. So there is ways to come and talk to us about where you are working and what you're interested in. Um, I think yeah, through our geoclips, through our websites, LinkedIn, um, you can sort of see what projects we are working on, whatnot. I'm not sure about data going out, the geochem data. I think it still needs to be processed. And then I don't know about raw data and stuff like that. I rather don't want to comment on it, to be honest. Thanks, Lee. Right. I think last chance. Any questions or comments? Okay, in that case, I would like to thank our speakers again. Uh, fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, Mark, especially thank you for getting up at the, even before the crack of dawn to join us. Really appreciate that. Um, again, I'd like to thank Matt and his company, Tacoma Strategies, for sponsoring us this month. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us on um, a Friday afternoon. Have a great weekend, everybody. And Craig, if you could end the meeting, please.